Kennedy, but I am so, so excited for our guest today. We have Brian Reeves, who I know um, a lot of you guys have been sharing content from in the group lately. Um, he's a relationship coach. He does a lot with masculinity and feminine energy, uh, a student of David Data. So I'm gonna go ahead and bring Brian on now. Guys, give a thumbs up in the comments if you can hear us okay. If the audio is good, give a thumbs up. Let me know. I'm going to check the feed and just make sure everyone can hear well. Um, OK, it looks like we're good to go. So Brian, I was listening to your most recent podcast the other day, and I learned that had Corona not been happening right now, this would be a really profound time in your life. Yeah. And I'm, I'm curious if you want to share how you're feeling, um, how it's been kind of adjusting to the new normal. Um, yes, that's right. Uh, we, my, my lady and I, we've been together for almost five years. We would next week be heading to Ireland for our wedding and our honeymoon and all of that. And uh, our, our families haven't even met. Our, our close families haven't even met in five years. And that's where we were all going to converge in kind of our spiritual homeland in Ireland. Is that where she's from? No, she's actually Armenian oh. from by way of Syria, Saudi Got Arabia, it. Syria. So, but, but both of us have a, I don't know, we just have a, there's a, there's something about Ireland that, that has its hooks in us, but yeah. I am part Irish. Okay. Uh, but, but she actually, kind of lit the flame of, of Irish love in me, actually. So mm -hmm. uh, it was a fascinating thing, but yeah, so we had to cancel that. And uh, that's been pretty, pretty, pretty heartbreaking. But I think it's weird. I think if we were the only ones that had to cancel a wedding, I think it would hurt more. But the fact that we're sharing globally in this experience, it's like, I mean, I don't know. It's strange. I don't really, I think what'll happen is the week we're actually supposed to be there is when I'll feel it the most. Yeah. Have yeah. you guys um, created any um, kind of like replacement rituals either for that day or for this time as a way to kind of honor the intention behind what you were going to do while it's being postponed? Yeah. You know, we've, we've talked about that. We've explored some ideas. We're sitting with some ideas right now, but uh, for example, like she, she doesn't even have her wedding dress because the store shut down. We can't yeah. get through to them. And she keeps wanting to show me pictures of, and I say, no, that's not <laughs> how it goes. We have to wait. <laughs> so, you know, it might be a year before I actually get to see this woman in her beautiful gown, but uh, yeah. you know, we're rolling with it. We're, 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 we're doing okay. We're, we're just grateful that we have a cozy home. We have each other yep. to go through this with. Uh, so, you know, all in all, we're, we're deeply blessed. Yeah. I love that. Um, great. Well, I have so much good content to dive into, so I'm just going to go right into one of the stickier questions. Ooh, okay, sticky. All right. I got my I got my gloves on. Actually, I don't. No gloves. No coronavirus gloves. We're, just, <laughs> we're, safe, here. we're safe here. So, and I actually share this one with you in advance because um, it was actually inspired by a quote that you shared on one of your podcasts. So this was an, an older episode. Uh, and the title is, Can a Man Be Friends with a mm. Woman He's mm. Attracted to? Mm. And I actually was inspired to listen for, um, I had a, a relationship in my life, a really powerful relationship um, with a man who we started off dating and the physical sexual chemistry really was not there. And we ended up staying friends. Um, and I think there might have been some attraction still on his part. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, he needed to cut the relationship off very quickly. Um, and it was he was like my best friend. It was like a relationship that I just held so close to my heart and loved so much. And it was hard. And so I think maybe that was my reason for clicking on it. Yeah. Uh, uh -huh. But it, it's interesting because um, the quote that you shared, which I'll read in a moment, actually made me think about another very painful relationship. So I um, want to share the quote and then some of the group members' responses. Yeah. Yeah. So the quote is, having lived for many years in a man's body, it is fascinating to have experienced what felt like love for a woman immediately vanish in the afterglow of a powerful orgasm. It is astonishing how quick sex can switch the male mind 
from the deep loving setting to the shallow kiddie pool setting. Any man who has had sex with someone whom he wasn't already in love with has most certainly experienced this bizarre phenomenon. Um, and I actually had a really, really painful dating experience. I've shared with the group about it before, but um, it was a man who um, we start, we met on a dating app. We started dating and it was just like explosive chemistry and the most fun mm -hmm. and just a really great like sense of humor chemistry and communication chemistry not necessarily relationship communication but just banter you know yeah. and i i learned a couple months in that he was just out of a really long-term relationship and not looking for anything serious and by that time i was like really falling for him mm -hmm. yeah. and um, you know, we had sex a couple times and then he ghosted. Mm -hmm. And so that's what made me think of this quote. Um, and I wanted to share some of the uh, male group members responses. So one response was, that's why it's so important to have sex with people to gauge this. Because if you want them just as much after orgasm, you can be bloody sure it's got a lot of potential. And when I read that, I kind of gasped because I felt a little bit like the collateral damage of someone not yeah. being clear on what they were feeling and what they wanted. Yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, I think someone quoted Joe, Ro Joe Rogan. You shared those comments with me as well. Someone someone quoted Joe Rogan uh, saying something like, that's why I need to fuck you to know if I like you. Yeah. And, you know, my heart hurts when I when I when I hear and read things like that. And and I get it. And I think um, it really speaks to deep disorientation for men, particularly women have their own version of this, but a deep disorientation around sexual energy and sexual practice and, and, and communication and even honesty and transparency, all of that, 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 that runs rampant through men. You know, one of my, one of my, when I was single before I met my partner, so this was my late, I met her when I was 41. So, you know, I was just through my teens, 20s and 30s, I was a mess. I was just always great intentions, a terrible execution in terms of relationship, uh, in terms even in, in the dating realm. Um, you know, I never did the big things. So the big betrayals like cheating on somebody or but but a, a million countless little betrayals here and there like this one that we're speaking at like yeah. not being honest about my desire and where, where i'm really coming from so to speak uh and i think this one of my greatest practices that i that i practiced in the in the in the few years before i met my partner was before sleeping with a woman in the dating in the early dating phase not you know she didn't have to wait months but quickly getting feeling into my own clarity around what are my intentions with this person where am i what am i really really wanting and even if i wasn't clear being clear about my lack of clarity mm -hmm. before we had sex or before we had sex twice anyway you know really practicing with that level of of uh, direct but kind communication. And one thing that I that I that I always I like to point out is is because there's this there's a sort of male masculine belief that you know honesty is the best, but but honesty can be very cruel. And so you know I, I like to say that honesty without kindness is is cruelty, but but kindness without honesty is manipulation. Yep. And this practice of fusing honesty and kindness, gentleness, but also honesty, I find that's, look, it's okay to not be clear. It's okay to not know where's this going? What do I really want with this person? I mean, that's the human condition yeah. so often. Uh, I think me and my partner, so we've been together for five years now. It, it, I, I, I knew uh, on some level immediately, I mean, the, within days that this is the woman I want to go for it with, but it took the rest of my system, my brain, the momentum I'd had from being single for six years. It took yeah. months for, for the rest of me to catch up and <laughs> probably, you know, the better part of a year it took for all of me to sort of be on board with that, with what was happening. 
So yeah. I think that's very normal. I think where we where we struggle is in the communicating of our our real raw experience as we're going along, sharing from a vulnerable, uh, uh, truthful but kind and skillful. I like this word skillful place as well. Not just vomiting everything that's happening for us. Blah, that doesn't serve either. Um, so anyway, I, I get it. I really get it. And it hurts my heart to hear because it does. It just sets up this condition where, okay, I, well, I'm going to just have my way with you as a man. I'm going to just, I, I have to have sex with you before I know if I like you. I mean, yeah. what cause for great harm is that? It's yeah. terrible. It's terrible. I, I, really, I really felt that when I read it. I was like, I felt like the pain of that moment several years ago. Um, and just how crushing it was. Of course, because because I mean, it's it's all about his. It's all about his uh, journey. It has there's no consideration for you in that. There's no consideration for how that that experience may leave you feeling afterwards. It's all about well, I need clarity, so you know we need to have sex so that I have clarity. You know, sorry if it hurts you, or I'm not sorry, not sorry. It's horrible. It's it's a complete lack of consideration for the other person in this dynamic. Um, so let's say there was a man who maybe has been operating from that place or that strategy up until now, mm -hmm. and he was open enough to consider a new way. What would you suggest to him in terms of like how do you get that clarity if you haven't been able to tap into that inner awareness yet? Yeah. Well, if he's clear that that's been a practice or a pattern of his, I think being open about that first, and, and, and I don't necessarily mean just on the first date, but early in the dating experience, probably before he has sex with her, uh, we're speaking heterosexually, but before he has sex, being honest about, look, I have, a, I have this pattern. And the pattern is that I think I like you or think I may even love you or there's possibility, but then I have sex and it turns out not that's not the case. And I've hurt people doing that. I've hurt myself. I've hurt others. And I, I don't want to do that anymore. I would really love to make love with you. Like this is where, see, I think, I think a, 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 a man who can own his desire and be willing to hear no in the face of it, yeah, that is a powerful man. I mean, that is that is that is a that is a, a, a for me even a, a, you know that is a, a I'll just say that is an admirable man. That is responsible manhood. That is mature manhood. I have this desire. Yeah, and I'm willing to hear no. I'm willing for you don't have to fulfill this for me. But I, I this is the experience I want to have, and just you know, I mean. That that's again, it's a it's an art, it's a dance, it's a navigating a you know kind of an edge of 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 honesty, kindness, transparency, uh, authenticity, but generosity. You know the the generosity of spirit, which is is you can say no, you don't have to fulfill this desire for me. I have it, and you. I mean, what 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 happens? What happens for you? I'm curious, Leia, when you just hear me say those words, what happens for you? Um, I think I feel like really safe because mm. the cards are on the table. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. You feel safe. You feel, you feel safe. You, you have agency. You really get, you know, a lot of women. I, I, a, a female friend of mine told me this years ago. She said that, uh, you know, growing up in America, uh, she was taught, number one, uh, don't depend on a man. And number two, don't inconvenience a man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that really, really landed with me. I've really gotten, I've seen that in my, in my own relationship, how, and, and my sisters, I have three sisters and I've seen how, you know, how common it is for women to really enmesh. And, and it's that beautiful, nurturing, caring energy that, that, that many women bring so naturally, but that, uh, in, in, in that sort of feminine version of codependence can be really wrapped up in the other person's experience. And I mean, men, we have our own version of this. It's not a woman thing. I mean, we all have this to some, in some one degree or another, but I, I saw, you know, as a man, I think one of the greatest gifts that I can ever give my partner is the, the space and the freedom and the safety to say no, 
to, in the face of my desire. Yeah. It's interesting because you had said a quote, or maybe it wasn't a quote, maybe it was the title of a podcast, why men want a woman who won't let him get away with shit. Mm. And I think because of the men I've dated up until now that weren't able to necessarily handle that or when I was, and when I say, um, let them get away with shit. Like I'm, I always do it with grace and honesty and vulnerability. It's not like tantruming or yelling. Right. But it's, it's like speaking my truth and, and calling them forward, so to speak. Um, and when I had done that with men that I've dated in the past, that's when like the ghosting happened or they disappeared. And so I haven't kind of necessarily gotten that like positive reward response yet where I did it and the guy like really kind of like stepped up. So, but, but I was kind of like thinking in those terms there. Well, I, 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 I don't know. Well, the way that I would language that is, is I want a woman that is going to, and a man needs a partner, whether that's a man or a woman or, but a man who would be a man who doesn't want to just stay in his adolescent psychological mindset. You know, adolescence, in adolescence, we don't have responsibility. We don't take responsibility. We're not adults. So it's not our responsibility, anything. We're just sort of finding our way in life. Mm -hmm. When we're ready for adulthood, that's all about taking responsibility. And one of my favorite quotes from all of the men's work, mm -hmm. all books, all the work I've ever done. It was a quote that I, I read in this book, King, Warrior, Magician, Lover. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The quote was, um, as, as, and I'm paraphrasing, I'm going to have it exact, but, but as men, we are willing to take responsibility even for that which we are not responsible. We are willing to take responsibility even for that which we are not responsible. Now, I hear those words and there's something that just happens in my body. Like I come alive, like there's an aliveness and excitement because all of a sudden there's like, whoa, challenge. I don't want to be disrespected by my partner. I don't want to be, you know, hit below the belt by my partner. That, yeah. that, that doesn't fly. I don't want to be treated harshly by my partner, Terry Real, who's another, who's an incredible uh, uh, re relational therapist who who specializes in working with men in therapy and couples. I'm laughing because we're a huge fan of him in the group and we call him DJ T Real, just affectionately. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> he says, harshness never works. Yeah. Harshness never serves, ever. And he's right. I don't want to be treated harshly. Now, um, you know, I do, I need to know where my partner's boundaries are because yeah. if I don't, I'm going to just sort of, you know, all the testosterone flowing in my body that is very focusing on my mission. I, I don't know if I'm hurting her or not. I can't yeah. know, you know, she has to give me that feedback yeah. that she's hurting. You know, she can do that skillfully. Yeah. Um, and, and, uh, you know, this is one thing that I work a lot with women is teaching them how to skillfully offer feedback, not criticism because criticism, you know, another word for criticism is, is direction, giving direction. That's not asked for, not wanted, not invited, just direction that doesn't serve another adult human being. Yeah. Right. But feedback is essential. And a man, again, who wants to remain in his kind of adolescent mindset He's not, he doesn't want that because he has to take responsibility for his actions. And that's not what adolescents do. Yeah. You know? There's a great Esther Perel quote behind every criticism is a veiled wish. And there have been a couple situations this week that have come up where rather than sharing um, something negative, I've led with my wish. Um, and it's had a really positive impact. I think people are just so much more receptive and less defensive if you just share the wish versus maybe a negative impact on how it made you feel. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I think it's still important that if you're hurt, we need to know. Oh, okay. If our, if our, if we've done something, said something and it hurts you, we need that feedback mm -hmm. because that's great. Uh, okay. I hear, hear your wish, but if I don't have a visceral, some kind of visceral sense of, how it affects you, 
well, I don't know. I may not want to grant that wish. I'm not, in, it doesn't, I may not be immediately inspired. Great. Have your wishes. I got my wishes too. I wish for a million dollars. I ain't got it. So, you yeah. know, yeah. I think, you know, one thing, you know, I told you about Ireland earlier and how it was lit up for me by, by really by my partner. I had been to Ireland a few times in my, in the years past, uh, only to Dublin, the city in, and I hadn't really tasted Ireland. And when I met Sylvie, there was a light in her eyes when she would speak of Ireland. There was a joy, you know, a, a, a skip in her step. Like she was lit up at the thought of Ireland. And I thought, wow, <laughs> I mean, that's feedback. That's positive yeah. feedback. That's, she didn't say, Hey, take me to Ireland. I wish to go to Ireland. She just shared with me this, like I, this twin, I could just see it in her body. And I planned a five week trip for us all around Ireland. And it was extraordinary. I mean, it, 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 we ended up getting engaged at the cliffs of Moher, but it was her feedback that inspired. And I, I got lit up by Ireland. I, I was like, Oh my God, how have I not been to this magical land in all these years? It was like, it was like, it's like the Shire in the Lord of the Rings. You know, the Irish people are hobbits. Remember the first day we got there, the bed was too short. My feet were sticking off the end of the bed. You know, the, and, and all the pubs and the singings like, oh my God, this is the land of the hobbits. It's amazing. Uh -huh. And yeah. it, was, it was her feedback, her, in this case, her positive feedback. Maybe there was a wish in there somewhere. I don't really remember, but I remember what I do remember is the way she lit up. And on the converse, there have been times when I've done or said something that has really hurt her, not out of any malicious intent, just out of, you know, we're two humans, we have different sensitivities, we have different worldviews around certain things, we have different ways of being, different ideas of what privacy means and all kinds of things. You know, it's just, it's inevitable that two people are going to hurt each other through the the lack of of, of understanding that only comes with decades of being with somebody yeah. um, and, and seeing her, her feedbacks, her, her embodiment that, you know, whether it's crying or whether it's now, if it's crying and you did this to me and you, 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 ah, that doesn't land well. You know, it's like, cause now I'm in my defense. Now I'm in my, my own wound, you know, which is, well, you don't know my heart. That's my wound. You don't see my, you don't see my good intentions. That's my yeah. personal you know, you don't see me, you don't see my heart. And, but when she, you know, when she's skillfully having her upset and her hurt and, and sharing what happened for her, while, while in a way acknowledging that, you know, my good intentions or that I, you know, she knows I didn't do anything wrong. That's a word I generally banish from, from, you know, my life. Uh, well, there's a different dynamic. It's like, it's an invitation to really care about what's happening for her. And if I'm a man that doesn't care, yeah, that's the moment I ghost, but then good riddance. Mm -hmm. but, does that make sense? Yeah, it makes total sense. You had said, I had popped into one of your Instagram lives, uh, maybe yeah. it was last week, and you had said um, in response to a question, society doesn't want women to feel anger or much of anything for that matter. Yeah. And I think, so that really like struck a chord. And I had two reactions. The first is, because I've done a lot of inner work and I've been drawn to people like Byron Katie, who mm -hmm. basically you can take any situation yeah. and you can turn it around and yeah. you can find your own role in co-creating it and how yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. what you're thinking about someone wasn't necessarily true. I think because I've done a lot of that work and because of the quote you shared about society doesn't want women mm -hmm. to feel like anything, particularly anger, I think in a lot of situations in relationship, rather than um, like gracefully voicing hurt or sadness or whatever I might feel in that moment, I kind of just like do the inner work internally without sharing it. Mm -hmm. And um, that's like kind of been a coping strategy maybe. Well, well, let me tell you something, Leah. I want you to know something. I've, I've, I've been up close and personal with Byron Katie on a few occasions. And because uh, I managed a music band that she loved, it, she was when her it was her it was the only band on her Facebook page back in whatever 2008 that she liked. That's and awesome. and I went I did her nine day school for the work. Yeah. You know we performed at some of her events. Let me tell you something. I have seen that woman. She fucking looked me up and down angry once. I don't. I can't. I can't know what was happening for her. But my experience in the face of her was holy shit. She is mad at me. 
Mm, now that's a story for another time. <laughs> Again, I don't know what was happening for her, but she let me have it. <laughs> and it's funny because my girlfriend at the time when I told her this story about, I think I made Byron Katie mad. She's like, Brian, you can make the Dalai Lama mad. <laughs> anybody, anybody, you make anybody mad. She was mad at me a lot, this girlfriend. Uh -huh. So I don't know, I have, I have a special talent for making women angry, it seems. Uh -huh. uh, fucking Byron Katie. <laughs> So all I'm saying is, and again, I don't know what was happening for Katie in that moment, but she was, she, she, I felt I was like trembling at, oh my God, this woman is intent, the intensity of her. So yeah. I love her teaching. I love her work. I mean, I use a lot of that, that yeah. mindset work in my coaching work and in my, it's, it's transformational and, yeah. and it can really lend itself to bypassing our human oh, experience. Sure. Yeah. And I think that's 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 what I'm 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 I, I really point at in my work and, and my own work has really evolved in the last five years, particularly with my partner who is who's deeply connected to her emotions. It's what really it's one of the things I first felt in her presence. I often describe uh, meeting her, the moment of meeting her. It was like someone had just pushed me into the deepest ocean. Like I just fell off this cliff and I was now swimming in this deep ocean and it was it was her emotionality mm -hmm. that was so intoxicating for me. And you know, my background in the military and I went to a military school, a engineering university, I was an engineer. So very, very disconnected from my emotions. And you know, uh, it makes sense that I'm, I'm partnered with this profoundly emotional, at least connected to her emotionality uh, person. Yeah. And, and so I'm, I'm a huge stand and I've worked with other coaches and teachers who do this, like the bypassing of the human experience is so damaging. Like there's no, there's no consideration for trauma inside of that. It's all kind of mental work, which I love, but I think a, a huge part of my work has been, and this is really the, the, the embrace of, of the feminine side of life is really welcoming in emotions and feelings, the visceral you know, even the uncomfortable kind of messiness of life back into, into our everyday lives. I think I've been robbed of my vitality because of that disconnect from my emotions. And I don't want that, 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 that was a miserable life to live. Mm -hmm. And I can go back to that place at times and it never feels good. And I do a lot of mental work. I do a lot of it, but um, you know, the teachers that I really study these days also <clears throat> bring in the emotional component as a, as a, as a, like a, it's like the boat, it's like the boat that the, the brain, you know, the mind kind of floats through life in. If we don't have our emotional feeling experience, you know, we're just, we're doing what Silicon Valley wants to do, which is just download the brain into a computer. Who needs a body anymore? Yeah. Who are some of the teachers now that you're most drawn to? <laughs> Uh, Abraham Hicks, believe it or not. Yeah. I'm a huge fan of Abraham Hicks. Um, <clears throat> and she's all about emotional guidance system, you know, tapping, feeling Joe Dispenza. His work has been really, uh, the last six months. He's, he's really put a, he's done a great job at bringing kind of have bringing a scientific perspective into mindset work and, and all the cascade of, uh, phenomena that happen in the body. Uh, I know he can get a little out there at times, um, but uh, I still love, love, love his work. Um, but then, you know, Esther Perel, of course, uh, Terry Real, just love Terry's work. Yeah. Uh, who else am I studying these days? Um, you know, a lot of men in the men's movement, uh, in the men's work, like Michael Mead, um, because I'm a 46, I'll be 46 in a few weeks. And I don't have, I didn't grow up with elders that I trust, you know, trust were trustable elders. And to this day, I still feel very disoriented with like, where are my elders? You know, even as I'm stepping into becoming an elder. And I think this is a challenge that a lot of men in particular, we don't, we don't have trustable elders. And, and so that's my hunger these days. That's why I started my podcast, Men This Way. It was really, yeah. it was really my attempt to find the elders and to have conversations with the elders. And, and it's interesting that a lot of the men I'm, I end up talking with are my age, in some cases younger, um, 
you know, it's, it's, yeah. So, so Michael Mead is an incredible teacher. Um, and I think that's like Terry real. He's an elder. Uh, let's see who else am I really looking at, but I'm also like uh, Robert Johnson. I wish I had his book right here. Uh, you know, Robert Johnson wrote these amazing, these three books called we, uh, he and she, oh. we, he, and she three different books. And they're all about the mythological journeys. So the, the stories of myth around masculine and feminine evolution and relational evolution. Women who run with the wolves, you know, Clarissa Pinkola Estes masterpiece that everyone, man and woman, I believe should, should, should read through. Um, yeah. I love it. Um, so on the topic of creating permission for vulnerability, both female vulnerability around emotions and uh, masculine vulnerability, one of our group members asked yesterday, men, in what ways has your partner helped you show up more vulnerably? And I was curious if you had any personal insights on that. Wait, help me understand the question. So in what ways has your partner helped you or almost like given you permission to show up more vulnerably in the relationship? Me as a man show yeah. up more vulnerably. That's a great question. Well, um, I think the, the, the most important, um, let's say act of service, I guess, uh, is, is, is her modeling it is modeling it modeling vulnerability one of the one of the, the the complaints that i hear so often from women in 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 relationship to men is he doesn't care about my feelings he doesn't you know why can't how can i get him to care about my feelings how can i get him to he thinks vulnerability i heard this just the other day he thinks vulnerability and and emotions are weakness right and it hurts and how do i you know and what, what occurs to me inside of that is one of the things that my partner has done so masterfully that has served me so well is she has been a stand for her own feelings. Yeah. Early in our relationship, maybe a month or two into our relationship, I remember I had done something that, again, good intentions, but it hurt her. And she shared with me that it hurt her. And... I remember I, I, I spent maybe 10, 15 minutes explaining to her why it shouldn't have hurt her. <laughs> you know that thing we men like to do, explain why you shouldn't feel that way because of this. And, that. and she listened to me for about 10 minutes. And then, she, you know, I had a pause and just sort of waiting to see if she, she bought into it. She was enrolled. And she just said, you know, Brian, nothing you just said makes any difference to my feelings. <laughs> Oh, stop me dead in my tracks. One of the most powerful things she's ever said to me, nothing you just said makes any difference to my feelings. Mm -hmm. And there I was just left in the lurch to deal with that, yeah. process that to like, there's just no, cause this is what we, this is what, you know, so one of the things that I'm, I'm often working with and, and when I work with, when I do couples work, I'll often tell them if you're still arguing, if you're still fighting or arguing about something after five or 10 minutes, you've gone too far. It's too late. No good solution is going to come from that anymore because uh, you're, you're probably lost in the stories and the explanations, the discussions, the, the counter arguments, the perspectives, all of that. You're lost. Yeah. And it's, you know, and you, it's, you, you're just you, you're crazy town. I call that place crazy town. Um, connection happens in, in the feeling experience, you know, in, okay, you, you're having, we're having, there's feelings in the space right now. Let's be with those feelings. Let's allow those feelings in, whether it's anger, whether it's, um, you know, there's a lesson. Oh, here's another another man that I've actually whose work I really admire is uh, uh, Stan Tatkin. Sure, he's incredible. And Sylvie and I, we actually got to do a, a session with him, and it was it was at a time. And I, I wrote about this in my blog. It was a time when we were really confronted by one of our our gaps. One of you know every 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 relationship has one or two or three kind of areas where it's like, holy shit, can we really be together? Like this, we're so yeah. far apart on this one issue. 
And we were hitting our wall with one of those. And I remember uh, one day, and I've, I've, written, I've written about this. So um, on my blog, I just share that because you know, I you know, I'm, I'm very careful with Sylvie's privacy, and you know, I, I'm a, I'm an open book. I'll blah, I'll share whatever, but. Yeah. She, you know, again, she has different experience with that. So uh, I've already have permission to talk about this from her. Um, I remember thinking that day we can't be together. It, it, we just can't. It wouldn't be kind for us to stay together. And I remember, you know, uh, the, the book, there's a book, The Course in Miracles. One of the lessons from A Course in Miracles, one of the first lessons is um, you're not worried for the reasons you think you are. Mm -hmm. Or you're not angry for the reasons you think you are. So I was like, okay, I held that in my thoughts. Okay, well, all right, I'm not worried. Okay, I can't, because I felt in my being like, no, 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 this is my lady. This is, but but this gap, my mind is telling me this gap, it's impossible. We, we can't navigate it. And we saw Stan later that day. And, um, you know, he does, he, his first, your first session with Stan is three hours. It's not a 45 minute therapy session, you know. Right. When I, when I work with couples, it's two hours. Yeah. I don't believe in the 45 minute, 50 minute. You're just getting to the good stuff, with a couple, <laughs> you know? So, um, and he said he was kind of putting us into, into the argument. You know, he was having us kind of reenact something that had happened. And as we were doing that, and he was sort of coaching us into different languaging around what was happening rather than getting lost in the story because he said something kind of almost under his breath as we were kind of doing this he said you know you two you're never angry for the reasons you think you are bing 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 it's like i my own mind had told me that earlier of course in miracles now here's stan tapkin this world-renowned therapist saying the same thing and it's you know all my work kind of in that moment just converging and I'm like i knew it i knew it there's something else here we're not angry. We're, and, and then he said this, you're not even arguing about the same thing. You're having two completely different arguments, right? And we, he's right. I mean, every couple, like when they're arguing, it's like, they're not even talking about the same thing. You know, one of the things I'm often helping couples do is get beneath the, what I call the level of complaint, mm -hmm. get beneath the level of the complaint. There's, yeah. it's like what you said, Esther Perel, every, every, what you say, every, every criticism, there's a veiled wish. Yeah. Yeah, it's beneath the level. The complaint is up here. And if we stay there, crazy town, we're lost. Yeah. yeah. But beneath that, there's a gold mine of healing and connection and 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 you know beautiful relating. And it's messy, which is why we don't want to go there. I don't want to go there. <laughs> Was it childhood stuff for both of you? What's that? Was it childhood stuff for both of you? Cultural, there's some yeah. cultural, yeah, which is childhood stuff at the same. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, yeah. totally, definitely. I mean, that's, it's, it's, yeah, absolutely. I mean, when, when two people learn how to just be with each other in the moment with what's arising without believing our stories and conclusions about it, but we can just kind of sit and, you know, if maybe we need to growl or cry or just hold each other or just, you know, just, just vent whatever it is, knowing that, you know, some, that's sometimes, sometimes Sylvie and I will, will early, early in a conversation, one of us will check and go, wait a second. Are you, do you just need to vent right now? Or are you actually, am I, are you actually, do I, am I supposed to respond? Mm -hmm. And, and when it's like, no, nah, I just got to vent. Ah, great. Oh, that's helpful. Okay. Mm -hmm. Go for it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Bring it. You know, and then all the emotions can come through and it can be nasty and, and uh, not, not disrespectful. But it can be, you know, it can just come through however it comes through. And it's like, oh, it's like a it's like a tropical storm that just passes through and then the air is clean and fresh and we're good. Yeah, that's a super safe feeling. Yeah. And but nobody ever taught me how to do that. Right. Nobody ever, you know, I think this is all I've ever seen. I think all any of us have ever really seen of anger, especially is is that it's it's destructive. We've only seen it used to destroy and tear down. Yeah. And we don't know that anger can actually be constructive, mm -hmm. that it can be connecting even when we yeah. when we channel it and, and, and practice, work with it in certain ways. And yeah. it's tragic because it, it does it, ugh, it robs us of our vitality. Yeah. Um, was there kind of a turning point in your work with Stan where everything shifted? 
so we didn't work with him long, but but what Stan really helped me, especially uh, you know, in my own journey as a as a coach working with couples myself, what he really what the work with him really grounded in in for me in a very visceral personal way is that you know because I tend to be more you know I'm more philosopher more head up oriented. And, you know, my scary place has been the body. Yeah. And working with Stan really helped me um, viscerally understand the importance of the body. David Data as well, working with David Data did the same. Yeah. But I think Stan did it in a different, you know, from a more therapeutic, you know, David Data is more like a, he's a sexual yoga and he's more of an artist, an artiste yeah. in his work. Whereas Stan Tatkin, he's a, he's a, he's a therapist. Yeah you know, um, mental health and therapy. And, and so, yeah, I think it was just more, and it's, this is my lifelong journey, you know, coming into inhabiting my body more fully being in that the practice of, cause it's so easy for me to just run into the safety of my thoughts, even though it's not always very safe there feeling talk about vulnerability as a man feeling what is here to be felt is can be terrifying, Leia, because there's a lot of grieving. There's a lot of pain, a lot of emotional pain that I believe so many men have not felt that if we were to feel it, 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 it would seem unbearable. Yeah. You had said, um, uh, or you had shared a great story about one of your retreats in Norway where a man initially was really skeptical. Why am I here? And by the end, he said, I finally understand the meaning of the word brother. Mm. It's that you get what I'm feeling. Mm. Oh, I get chills just you, you recalling that. Yeah, I'd forgotten about that. Oh, it was so beautiful. I, I think this is yeah, you get what I'm feeling. This is what a man said in a room full of almost 30 men who didn't even know each other a week prior. And as a, yeah, he was very skeptical. He didn't know why he was there. He was, you know, kind of came in with a kind of chip on his shoulder, not trusting other men, which I get. I didn't trust men for a lot of my life. And for him to say that at the end of this week long retreat, brother. And he, and he said that at the beginning, I don't know why we're saying this word brother. Why are you calling me my br brother? You're not my brother. I don't know you, yeah. but brother means you get how I feel. <sighs> you know, one of the things that I, I, I strongly stand for, for men is, is gathering regularly with other men. Yeah. I have a weekly, I'm, I'm actually a part of right now, I would say four different, four different men's groups. Um, in various capacities. And that, that's not that I'm leading, that I'm just a part of, yeah. um, one of which meets weekly. And having that space where, where we can be vulnerable with each other, where we can cry, we can be angry, we can challenge each other, confront each other. Like there are just, there, there are certain things that my own partner is not supposed to hold for me. Yeah. And that, you know, going to a therapist's office even doesn't really do it for me. But in a circle of men, a circle of peers, you know, that we can, that we can, we conflict can arise within and, and, and we can, can move through it in a way that, that brings us closer. And, and some men can't do that. I mean, I've had men drop out of these men's groups because conflict arose and they just, they didn't know how to move through it. Uh, and so they had to leave. You know, it's, but this is the beauty of these spaces is, is it's a crucible of sorts, you know, that we men, we need, we need other men. Our healing comes, I believe as a man, our healing comes, there's so many ways that our healing comes about, but one of them is in the presence of other men. Yeah. There's a movie that I share and, um, and laud so frequently, which I'm sure you've heard of, uh, the mask you live in. Yes. Yeah. And one of the most powerful scenes is, I think it's like in a Compton, uh, Los Angeles classroom, there's a guy, Ashanti Branch, who's essentially creating a space for men's work. 
um, in an all African American school, which is traditionally, you know, it's about like pastoring and having the the clothes and the guns. And I would say this actually having worked in a inner city all African American high school with seniors, so I'm intimately familiar with that culture. And um, and he's created a men's group where vulnerability is really elevated, yeah. um, and it's so powerful to see the transformation. You know, you see this a lot in men, whether, whether you know, in, in different cultures of men where we adorn our bodies with brand names, with big fat watches or, you know, these status symbols. Well, of course we do that when our inner world, we feel unworthy of our manhood. When we haven't had elder men initiating us into a mature manhood, when we haven't had elder men telling us we're good enough, we're worthy of love, we're okay as we are, that our feelings are welcome. I think one of the most exciting things that I'm seeing as I look into the world out there is that more and more we're seeing young boys being welcomed in their crying for example, being welcomed, you know, to have their anger, being being directed in how to have it, but but that it's being welcomed and 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 um it, it warms my heart because I didn't I didn't get that. And so many men, most men of my generation, we didn't get that. And 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 man, how can we show up in our relationships? How can I think you know one of the things I love about Esther Perel's work is she 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 has a, a an incredible grasp of the evolution of relationship and how today modern relationships are about something about something they've never been used for which is emotional support mm -hmm. they've never been about emotional support throughout and also intimacy intimacy exactly and we've never done this before. And here we are all of a sudden being asked to do it, to, to provide, to emotionally connect and provide emotional support when for our entire lives, we've had our emotions excavated out of us. Yeah. How the hell are we supposed to do intimate, emotionally supportive relationship when we've had our emotions excavated out of us yeah. for a lifetime? Mm -hmm. It's like we're set up to fail. You know, so I think, you know, coming kind of full circle back to your question, modeling, you know, I think this is where, you know, women, again, I know we're talking in a heterosexual context. Sometimes it's, it's the man who is the more emotional partner yeah. in a relationship. Um, but whoever that person is being a stand for those feelings that they be welcome, that they be not just tolerated, but embraced and felt. Um, not not used as a platform to abuse each other. Right. No, 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 no. That doesn't fly. No. But allowing them to be felt, uh, that's the greatest gift my own partner has given to me. And, you know, again, because I've done a lot of work over the years and I have a great, like Byron Katie work, you know, I have a great yeah. grasp of like, like you, Leah, I'm, I'm yeah. a great internal processor. Yeah. So I'm often in our relationship, I'm often the stand for, for that line of, of, you know, Hey, this is yours. That's mine. Yeah. You know, this is let's, let's honor the, 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 you know, cause, cause in that emotional world that things can get messy and it's all mixed up and you need both. You need the, you need the, the, the mind that can kind of cut through and say, okay, you know, see the, where the boundaries are, the barriers where the, you know, this is mine, that's yours. And, but you also need the emotional heart that it's like, let's let's feel everything that is here and and i mean that's that's a well-rounded relationship where you have great perspective but 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 a lot of feeling as well i think yeah i can i can definitely relate to that um there was one final question that i really wanted to um make sure that i fit in it actually came through today from an okay. anonymous group member um it's a little bit of a non sequitur but we'll just go with it that's hard so um, so this woman messaged me. She's been married for, uh, I think, about two decades now. They have two children together. Um, she shared very vulnerably that um, she doesn't necessarily have the most comfort with her sexuality, but it's an area that she's realized that there are opportunities to work on, and she's been learning and growing. Um, and at the close of her question, she said, here's why I'm reaching out. 
for my husband, it's really important for him to give me the orgasm. Mm. And what I most enjoy is when I'm on top and I'm kind of grinding and it's a clitoral orgasm. I think a lot of women can relate to that. Mm. Um, but he doesn't feel like he is responsible for that. And it becomes a problem in their sex life. Yeah. And I remember when I first, um, the question came through and I first read it. I definitely had a reaction like, whoa, there's a lot of ego there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and since when did a woman's sexuality and pleasure be about his ego? Now, granted, I know that's a big part of patriarchy and we're still seeing a lot of the effects of patriarchy. Yeah, I, I would say since forever. Forever. But I guess my question for you is, if you can put yourself in her shoes, mm -hmm. um, how would you navigate um, a trying to kind of coach him from a place of, I need to be the one to give this to you to a higher level. Well, yeah, the thing I want to say first is when sex is orgasm centric, orgasm focused, um, in other words, outcome focused, we're setting ourselves up for, 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 for what's the word I want to, for disconnect. Right. When we're when we're outcome focused, when it's all about the orgasm, we're essentially we're just going to use each other anyway for to get to that outcome. That's really what we're doing. Um, you know, there's a there's a saying in, in, in the in, in my that I use a lot in the in the in my coaching work is I'm really not interested in, in helping you uh, move you know, rearrange the furniture inside of your prison cell. You know, there's kind of a prison cell that they're, they're living in, in this, in this kind of orgasm focused, uh, mindset. I love orgasm. Nothing wrong with orgasm. I mean, orgasm is healthy. There's a lot of great, great things about orgasm. But again, when we make it the point of sex, um, we set ourselves up for disconnect. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing that I would, I would encourage this couple to maybe talk about, maybe reflect on, or, or at least this person asking the question is, is, is maybe, because you think about it again in terms of masculine and feminine relating. We will just use that frame. Um, and by masculine, just to be clear, I don't mean man and feminine, I don't mean woman, but I just mean the dance of masculine and feminine intimacy. In our, in our masculine mode, we're all about outcome, right? It's why he wants to be the one to give it to you because it's like a goal that he has. And I got to, you know, the masculine always wants to get to the end, right? And when two people are in their masculine mind, it's like, let's get to the end of this, which is the orgasm. And, and now there's a power struggle about who gets us there and how we get there. And again, it's, it's just like, it's two rams on a, on a mountainside, just boom. And that is not a very fun way to have sex. So um, the, 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 the f that's the masculine way of sex. Get to orgasm. The, the feminine aspect, let's just say, of sex is ah, we're connecting, enjoying the journey, the pleasure of the moment, experiencing each other's bodies. And again, I know I'm a man. We're not taught that. We're taught let's get to the end. Mm -hmm. And I think... Yes, this is a fragile thing because our a, a man's identity is wrapped up in his doing. If I do well, if I do good, I am good. If I do you good, that means I am good. You know, in the sexual experience, if I do you good, if I blow your brains, you know, if I blow your mind, that's a weird way of putting it. If I, yeah. But if I rock your world, ah, I'm good. Right. It's all about him. Yeah. She's only an instrument for his own self-worthiness. Yep. Right? So, I mean, you see the premise. The whole premise of this is it's like a false premise. So I just want to introduce that into, into this dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, so now having done that uh, and knowing that he's probably, let's just assume he's not watching and she is wanting insights on how to navigate this. Mm -hmm. So. That's just my, 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 my first suggestion is let's just, let's just maybe step back from the orgasm focused sexuality. Yeah. Um, 
Now, there is something, there is an opportunity perhaps for her to practice if she chooses surrendering more into his direction, if you will. You know, if he wants to give her an experience, well, um, I wonder if she could practice, and this requires her to also let go of her kind of masculine drive to orgasm, but to surrender and, and allow herself to be pleasured by him. Now, this requires her to give him feedback, Leia, because mm -hmm. if he's doing something and it's not working for her, she needs to communicate that. And I would also add it requires him or them collectively to set a tone or a feeling where the experience isn't going to be evaluated based on her response. Um, I mean, I've certainly been in circumstances where um, the man giving me pleasure has been a focus, but there's been this underlying energy um, of we're working towards an outcome. Exactly. This better work. Yeah. This better work. You better orgasm. Right. Because if you don't, then uh, problem, shame, upset. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why, absolutely. That's why I'm, that's why I, I want to start this conversation with like, let's reel it back from the orgasm focus, from the outcome focus, you know, even possibly set a timer, you know, for 15, 20 minutes. And just during that 15, 20 minutes, he's going to just explore giving her pleasure and she her practice is just to relax and offer feedback what feels good what doesn't what's you know what's not working what is working and let him kind of find his way and navigate that um and again i say set a timer just so you know okay in 15 minutes 20 minutes we're done doesn't matter if there's an orgasm or not this right. is not about orgasm this is about this is about setting up a dynamic where he's now giving, you know, that, that whole part of, of him wanting to give her an orgasm is, I, I do believe it also speaks to that deep, deep primal yearning for a man to be needed, to feel necessary, to, to be the gift gifter of his presence, of his loving. And, and for that deep feminine yearning in, in, in her, in this case, to be receiving, you know, the feminine is the is the receiver, the masculine is the giver. Again, that's not a man woman thing. That's just a, it's a very primal poetic dynamic. So it's a practice that they could, that she could perhaps suggest, yeah. you know, that it's, it might be edgy for her as well to surrender in a way and to allow him to explore, but she has to give him feedback. Yeah. That's I key. Yeah, I think one of the challenges, um, again, not knowing really much about their relationship at all, in relationships where let's say they're a long-term relationship, maybe 20 years and they have kids and the relationship has evolved more into like a management ink versus like a deep uh, intense connection. Right. I think the idea of having performance-based sex can be like this sigh of relief, like we're gonna do it and it'll last 10 mm -hmm. minutes and then it'll be done. And the idea of connection-based sex can be really scary because the emotional connection and the intimacy is already kind of shaky and then you're taking it to a physical realm. Yeah, totally. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot of layers I'm sure to this that we're not privy to. And, yeah. and that couple, I, 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 I am a huge fan of getting support you know, to navigating these things, working with whether a therapist or a coach or, but you know, we're, we're not supposed to figure this stuff out alone. Yeah. And that's but okay. I appreciate the opportunity to, to share it with you and to kind of talk through it um, at least initially together. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great question. So on that note, we're out of time, but I wanted to give you an opportunity to share with our audience how they can find you. I know that you're doing uh, Instagram lives quite a bit now. So when are those happening? How can they get in touch with you? Yeah, thank you. So uh, again, my I'm Brian with a Y. That's Brian Reeves <laughs> with a Y. Um, yeah, every Wednesday I'm doing, uh, I do this new broadcast called uh, Wisdom Wednesdays. Uh, it's Wednesdays at 6 p.m. Uh, US Pacific time. I actually do it on my Facebook channel, but okay. also uh, on Instagram, my Instagram, Brian Reeves Insight. Uh, but my my website, brianreeves.com, is all my blogs and all videos and all my different relationship 
courses and uh, my partner Sylvie, who's amazing, she just we just put out a program to together though she's leading it called uh, dating with attachment styles as your guide uh, she's incredible like um, but but Brian Brian with a y Brian Reeves.com <clears throat> is one-stop shopping for for everything and my podcast men this way any men watching uh, please you know join me on that podcast it's such a the, the conversations we get to have there with with right now it's exclusively with 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 what i believe are wise men you know we're eking sort of squeezing the wisdom out of our experiences um i think it's invaluable uh please join us there we have a lot of women listening as well they get a lot of value out of it uh, you're right myself included yeah. So, uh, uh, but yeah, but, but Leah, the, I've, this has been an honor. Thank you so much for, for inviting me into this. Thank you so much. I know that we have reached so many or touched so many people today and our time is the most valuable thing we have. And I so appreciate you sharing yours with us today. Yeah. So, um, sending you and Sylvie love, um, and hopefully we'll be out of this soon and you can go on with your um, with your wedding and your yeah. as well so thanks again brian and uh we'll catch you soon okay leah thank you bye bye